All right, welcome everyone to our kind of unbelievably third event in our SEL speaker series. Um, I'm super excited to have everyone here. For anyone who doesn't know who I am, my name is Amber. I am the director of Laws and Learning. We are a nonprofit um, that really focuses on professional development, community development, empowerment through education. Um, and we're based at Laws and Collegiate School. So we're here in Memphis. Um, we have partnered with Lausanne's director of SEL, Social Emotional Learning, uh, Greg Graber, to bring you this series. Um, we're really excited. We've had some awesome talks so far. You can see all the recordings from the previous sessions on our website as well. They are absolutely worth checking out. So before Greg introduces our speaker tonight, Really quickly, I just kind of wanted to go over a couple of logistics. As I said, we're probably all Zoom experts by this point, but um, everyone entered muted. So we'll have Q&A at the end. You can feel free to pop in. If you don't want to talk, this is being recorded. You can put your question in the chat and I'll be happy to ask it. Um, but we only do that, not because we don't love your lovely voices, but because it just went on background noise. Um, we also, just in case anything happens like Zoom wise, knock on wood, we haven't had any security issues, any weird Zoom stuff in the last over a year now. But um, if that does happen for any reason, I will immediately close this Zoom. I'll send you a brand new link and we'll just hop back on. Um, one more thing, we will of course be recording this session and I'll have that to you sometime this week, probably tomorrow. It'll also be on our website and it's on our YouTube channel as well. Um, if you need anything, and I'll talk more about this at the end, from me after this, like a letter that you attended or anything like that, um, you, everybody's got my contact info and I'm happy to provide those. Um, so I'll be moderating the chat. I'll also be moderating the waiting room. So if anyone needs to leave and come back, feel free. I'll be here to let you in. Greg, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speaker tonight. Well, thank you so much. I am delighted to introduce Patrice Reed. I've known her for quite a while. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna age myself or or Patrice, but Please don't. <laughs> she, she is a a well respected uh, pediatrician in our community and a great supporter of our learning community over the years at Lausanne. She and her husband, uh, the other Dr. Reed have four outstanding young adults, it's hard to believe they're adults now, who have uh, all graduated from Lausanne. Um, I had more people excited when I said that Patrice was gonna be a part of this speaker series than, than anyone before, and we are delighted to uh, soak up her wisdom. She's very busy, and we are so grateful for you uh, giving a little bit of your time tonight, Patrice. So I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Greg. And thank you guys for showing up tonight. I know that if your life is like mine, we're torn in so many different directions there. So really, thank you for spending this next hour with me. Um, as Greg says, I'm a pediatrician. So I am not a teacher. I am not a lecturer. I am not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm a mom and I'm a doctor. And because I've been wearing these hats for so long, this topic that we're gonna talk about tonight is just really dear to my heart. Um, we're gonna be talking about resilience, or I think the way I call this um, talk, uh, cultivating resilience in our children. Um, but before we get started, I just wanna let you know that I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes and I really would like to be able to hear from you guys. I, I am kind of a pediatrician who likes to really get connected to the people that I'm talking to. And I would like to actually hear your experiences if you're willing to share them. So that being said, um, does anybody know the definition of resilience or have a decent idea what resilience is? Okay, so, so, okay. So the definition that I like is that to me, resilience is the capacity to rise above difficult circumstances. It is the trait that allows us to exist in the less than perfect world that we're living in while moving forward with optimism and confidence. As a mom, I have been faced with so many different times where my children have come to me just in agony, 
and in pain about a certain situation that they're going through. And each and every time I've always wanted to be able to take that pain from them and, and, and own it myself. But if I had done that, my children would not have been able to experience the joy of getting over the pain. They would not have been able to experience empathy when they saw other kids suffer. They would not have been able to experience, know what the good stuff is if they hadn't gone through the bad. As a pediatrician over the years, I've had a lot of patients come through with just a lot of difficult issues. And especially this past year with pandemic, um, it's been awful. It has been simply awful. But every time I would see my patients in the office, I would try to give them just a little bit of advice about what I thought that they could do just to get through the hurdle that they're in. And I always love when they come back to me saying, Dr. Reed, we did it, we overcame it. I give them a hug and I said, just keep on tracking along there. So the question is, how do we create resilience in our kids? The good thing is they've already got it. It is already built into their DNA. All we have to do is to make sure that they know it and be able to become resilient whenever they're faced with whatever life has to offer. There's a book that I've read recently and I said, hope that you guys would kind of pick it up because it is a great book. It's by a Dr. Kenneth Ginsbrook and it's called Building Resilience in Children and Teens. And he likes to describe resilience basically as a product of seven different building blocks. And his thoughts are that if we equip these children with these building blocks, our kids will be resilient. Simple as that. He calls these seven building blocks Um, the seven C's. And they're basically competence, confidence, character, connection, contribution, coping, and control. And so kind of what I'm going to do is just kind of talk briefly about each one, and then we're just going to open it up to discussion. So basically, competence. What is competence? It's simply the ability, ability to handle situation or task effectively. And in order for us to create or allow our kids to have competence, we as parents need to do a few things. The first thing is we need to get out of the way. What do I mean by that? You know, basically, we as parents, we tend to always want to solve our problems for our children. But when we do, it undermines their ability to tackle them. It also makes them much more dependent on us. So basically, if we try to help our children solve their problems by simply just getting out of the way and just gently guiding them through their decision making, it makes them so much more confident. Another thing that we do as parents, we tend to lecture. Whenever our kids come up with a problem, we tend to basically, you know, go on and on and on about why did it happen? How come you made it happen? What do you need to do from this point on? What I would have done if I were you and go and go and go. And the key is, do you really think that our children are listening the whole time? No, they really zone us out probably after the first couple minutes there. And so what do we need to do to make it work for our kids? I think the first thing is we just need to shut up. We need to shut up and basically get on their level, be able to allow them to take the driver's seat and guide them along to solving the problem step by step with ideas that they came up with themselves rather than us dictating what they need to do. And if we do that, it just makes the kids so much more competent and makes themselves, make them happy because they're able to tackle a situation without us telling them what they needed to have done. The other thing that we need to do to kind of help foster competence in our children is simply try to discourage perfectionism. And that's a hard one. That's a real hard one for me because mom of four kids, I mean, you know, early in the day, we always wanted our kids to do their best, make sure that they get, you know, the best grades, do the best this or whatever. But we realized early on that that we, we were doing more harm than good because when we try to instill our children to be perfect, 
they tend to be fearful of taking the initiative to do something that they're not so comfortable with doing. So rather than encouraging your children to be perfect, you just want them just to, just to put forth a good effort, just to, 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 to try. And that's what we need to praise. Praise them for trying to do something, even though the outcome may not be great there. And let them know that it really is okay to fail. We all fail at one time or another, but we learn from our mistakes and it just makes us stronger and much more resilient in the long run there. So confidence is that next one in the seven C's. Children cannot gain confidence without experiencing their own competence. Confidence assures children that they have some power over their environment. They are more likely to persevere and have an optimistic outlook rather than feeling powerless. Adults can nurture confidence by teaching problem solving skills and providing a safe opportunity to practice these skills. But confidence needs reinforcement. So how do we as parents um, reinforce confidence? I think the first thing is we just need to pay attention to our children at all times. And when we catch them doing good, we need to praise them for it. But we don't praise them with just general words such as, oh, you did great. But be really specific about what you praise them for. Like, I like how you you kicked that soccer ball and made that goal. I like how you 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 called your friend when he was not feeling well. Give specifics because when you do, it just makes it so much more powerful. The worst thing you can do to, um, uh, to create confidence is basically to instill shame or to find fault with every single thing your child does. You know, kids are going to make mistakes, but if we recognize their strengths and remind them of the ability to succeed, we energize them to transform failure into a learning experience from which they can rebound. The next in the seven C's is connection. Connection to others provides reassurance that we will be fine even in the tough times. It gives us security and it convinces us to take chances. There are so many people that are in your children's lives right now that can provide a wonderful source of connection. First are the parents, um, grandparents, teachers, if you uh, have a religious background, folks in your church, community uh, leaders in various organizations. Parents can do uh, increase their connection simply by just, again, being there for their kids and always being willing to listen no matter how tired we are. Trying to make time for your children, you know, even in our busy schedules, whether it be eating dinner or having a game night or a movie night. You know, during the pandemic, um, I had the, the luxury of having all four of my grandchildren home at one time. And even though times were so crazy, we absolutely loved every weekend we would get together in the room that actually I'm sitting in right now is our media room. And we would either watch a movie or we watch a program together there. I think building that special moment carry them throughout the difficult times that they were gonna face forward there. And so if you, as parents of children, whatever age they are, just find time for that connection, I think it's gonna be great. Um, also, kids can need to be connected, as I said, to other family members, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles. Um, and it's hard, especially with this pandemic. But guess what? We've got telephones, they can text them, they can email them. They can do these Zoom conference chats. We actually do it a lot with our family on, on weekends now just to keep that connection going. The other thing is to get your kids involved in organizations within the community where they can get that, that connection. Um, when my kiddos were growing up, um, we got them involved in organizations like Bridges. I think of maybe you've probably heard of that one. It's real popular in the city. Um, Memphis Challenge, which is another great organization where um, there is so much mentoring going on. And an organization called Jack and Jill, where children um, who are from different schools get together and, and just, you know, bond and have that connection, a connection that will hopefully take them, you know, quite away, even as they get older. 
The other thing too, connection through the teachers. You know, we are blessed to be part of the Lausanne community. And uh, my children have turned to their teachers um, so many times back in the day. And as I said, oftentimes they would even talk to them without even letting my husband and I know what was going on. But again, that connection through the teachers was awesome. So with, with that social, without that social foundation, kids are reluctant to test themselves or try new ventures. But if they don't take such risks, they remain isolated and they remain timid. They won't move forward to develop the new competence or confidence they need. So connection is really important. The next C, character. Every family has his or own recipe for good character. In my family, my husband and I uh, tried to instill, you know, love, being loving, being kind, being benevolent, benevolent, um, being responsible, um, being a hard worker. Those were some traits that we instilled. Only you know what's best for your child, but it's important that character development actually comes from you, the parent. Children learn character by values that you teach, words of praise, or the way that you correct them. They learn by observing your values and your behavior in your daily interaction outside your home and watching how other adults treat each other within the home. When people have strong character, they have the ability to return to a set core of values during crisis, which makes them much more resilient in trying times. The next C, contribution. When people work to improve their community, they have a sense of purpose. And parents can support these activities by enabling their children to give rather than receive. Kids need to learn that the world does not resolve, revolve around them and that they are not owed anything. You can help your children um, um, contribute to society by a whole host of things, um, you know, by uh, feeding the needy. We actually did that ourselves with one of my own kiddos during the pandemic. We went to, uh, I think, one of the uh, schools in South Memphis, and we gave out food to people who basically were, you know, struggling at the time. And it just made my son, Jason, um, just feel so much, you know, so much, I guess, happier because he felt like he was doing something for someone else. Um, you know, kids can, you know, even do things like cleaning up the environment or, or whatever, but contribution just makes them much more resilient because they realize that they gain something positive and it gives them something that they want to strive to achieve. They learn that although they serve, they receive so much more than they could ever give. The next C, coping. Resilience requires a wide range of coping skills um, to deal with the stress and challenges that we have in life. There are ways that you can actually um, help your children to be uh, able to cope. But first of all, you need to really recognize the signs or symptoms of someone that's having a hard time of, of coping. Kids are funny, you know, adults, you can kind of pick up, you know, if they're feeling sad or moping, but children, you may not really see that. They may be just a little bit more irritable. They may be more tearful. They may have a lot of just really vague complaints such as chronic belly pain and not wanting to go to school or just feeling really tired or chronic headaches. Always look at your children. I cannot stress that enough. And when you see something that's not normal that's a little bit different try to reach out to them and see or figure out what's going on and if they don't open up please make sure that you get them to their pediatrician or to someone to kind of help you get to the bottom of it there are a lot of ways to cope there are some positive ways and there's some negative ways we don't want our kids to do the negative uh, way of coping we don't want them to turn to things such as alcohol or drugs, eating problems, self-mutilization. We want them to have positive coping skills. One of the main ways to cope positively is simply encouraging children to attack their problems head on and to analyze the size of the problem rather than just 
thinking, oh, this is too big for me to handle. And then even just breaking the problem in smaller chunks. So they know that the small chunks are something that they can easily manage. The other ways for children to cope in a positive way is just basically taking care of themselves. And again, you as parents can help them do that. You know, make sure that they're getting plenty of good exercise. Make sure they're taking time to relax. It's so very important. Make sure they're eating well. Make sure they're getting good rest. Make sure that they are doing something outside of just their routine schoolwork, but having a hobby that they can turn to just to kind of relieve stress when they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And then also make sure that they're, they're staying connected and talking to their friends or people who are, are positive influence on them. When kids see you doing those particular things as far as coping, they really realize that that's something that they should do. So please, you as parents need to lead by example too. The final C, control. Basically, children need to learn to control their actions and their outcomes. They need to understand that things don't just happen to them, but they need to learn inner control by making decisions and facing consequences gradually um, so they can become independent and resilient. There are a few ways that they can do that. And actually, um, one way to help gain control in children is basically through Again, active parenting, listening, making sure that you're always listening to kids, but also steering them into um, something that they call choreographed conversation. And what that is, is basically is where it's just a casual conversation between parent and child. And, but the parent has a hidden agenda that the parent is trying to steer the child to solve the problem using his own ideas rather than the ideas that the parent is trying to force on him. Another way to help children uh, have more control is by doing something called a ladder trait or a ladder technique. And this is sort of where the children, you, you can actually take a piece of paper and you can actually put the problem that the child has um, on the paper. That's the base of the ladder. And then you explain to your child that there's basically two different ways to go up the ladder. There's a positive way that has a really good outcome, and there's a way that's not so positive there. And then just kind of help encourage your child by his own thoughts, think how he can go from one step to the next up the ladder. Bottom line is when we try to, again, take us out of the driver's seat, but put our children into the driver's seat, our children will gain a sense of control there. And it's a good, great way to help, again, foster resilience there. So basically, those are the seven C's. Again, competence, confidence, character, contribution, connection, coping, and control. And again, the good thing is that Children already have the ability to do it. We just need to make sure that they know it. And by showing your children, again, that you care for them, that you're there for them, that no matter what they do, you're always going to love them. Again, you may not like what they do, but, you, but it's not that that you don't like. You love your child, and you always want to make sure that you do that, know that. Your kids are definitely going to be resilient, they're going to be receptive to your guidance, and we're going to get the great kids that we always hope to have. Um, questions, you know, what I'd like to do now, first of all, if there are any questions before I kind of play a little game with you guys. So I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, just a lot of, I totally agree. This is this has been really eye-opening. Um, and I did link that book in the chat for everyone yeah. too. So I'm yeah. going for everyone to check there's it out. There's another book too that, you know, in addition to that book by Dr. Ginsburg, there's another really good book by Dr. Harold Poplix. And it's called, um, the, uh, actually it's called The Scaffold Effect. And it really, it's, it's a great book because in that particular book, what uh, Mr. Coplitz tries to do is to um, use the analogy that your child is actually a building and the parent is a scaffold. And then 
basically the parent's job is not again to 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 you know do everything for the child but basically support the building so when the building starts to shift or fall or any issues that scaffold acts as support and so he actually makes a lot of comments on you know ways you can do that and there were a lot of things that we talked in that I just briefly talked about that he mentioned in his book. So I'd recommend that you get both those books. They're really great reads and very easy ways and, and good resources to have in your library too. Well, so kind of what I like to do right now is I wanna hear from y'all. I wanna hear what you see maybe in your own children that you found were ways that they were showing resilience and, and basically see and, and also maybe after you heard about those seven C's kind of you know hone in on maybe some of those C's that you've seen as a way that your child was able to become resilient. Any takers? Well I'll start. <laughs> I'll start. I have lots of examples there. I'll start with one of mine. And I hope this is about one of my children. And I really hope that he is not on this Zoom talk um, because I told him not to do so because I knew it would make me nervous. But this is regarding actually my oldest son, um, Jared. Jared actually uh, went to George Mason University. I think he graduated, oh my gosh, several years ago. Um, how long, Dr. Graber? I can't even remember. Um, probably. Was, yeah, I don't, I don't want to age either of us. A few years ago, but, a few years ago. But, but by anyway, the way, by the way, he is signed up for this. Just so I hope know, he so decided to not show up though. <laughs> but anyway, Jared went to George Mason University and, and he was gung-ho from day one. He wanted to become a lawyer. So he took all these government classes. He took uh, classes in criminology. He joined all these organizations that uh, political science organizations. He uh, he just basically got out and did so much, you know, work in the community with hopes of becoming a great lawyer. So they were proud of him. My parents, my husband, and I were so proud. There were no lawyers in the family. He said, "Oh, this is great. Jerry's going to Jerry's going to do this." So he kept plugging along, and then the few weeks just before the end of his first of his last semester in college um he came to us and he said you know mom and dad I can't do this I I cannot go on to law school after he'd already taken the LSAT he already started the application process and so forth he says I just can't do it well we said okay can you tell us why he says, I just, I don't know. I just, there's something in me. I just can't do it. And so we sat back and said, well, if you don't do that, what do you want to do? I really don't know. Bottom line, Jared, I think, you know, was experiencing a lot of anxiety. He was, he was fearful about what the future had in store for him. And rather than verbalizing it, he just, he just basically shut down. He shut down and he couldn't move. So what did we do as parents? We could have lectured him. We could have, you know, talked him through and said, you're going to do it. You're going to be fine. You just need to keep pushing. But instead, we just let him sit back and we let him basically analyze what was going on in his life and thought and, and think it through step by step about what could he do to move forward. Bottom line is it took him two years, but he did. He actually, you know, picked up a sub, couple side jobs. He um, decided to, you know, um, talk to people. But basically, he turned it around and he just went on, got into law school and moved forward there. But I think the reason why he was able to succeed were for a couple reasons. Number one is because my husband early on, we had always instilled in our kids, just again, not to be perfect, but just, just, just to do your best you know, just to find, you know, just to keep trying, just to keep trying. I think that was one of the reasons why he was able to get through. Another thing is, I think just the connection of having our support, of having to know that we were there for him through thick or thin, knowing that we weren't questioning him, but we were allowing him to figure it out. Having the connection of 
friends, you know, family members to know that we were behind him. And then also the thought process, him trying to think it through, him looking at the solutions, you know, the, the, the solution of him moving forward if he had, you know, gone on to school versus if he had taken another route in his life there. But basically, he was resilient. You know, he was at his rock bottom, but he turned it around and he moved forward. And now he's practicing in St. Louis and he's a happy guy there. Um, another situation um, actually has to deal with my youngest son. And I don't think he's on his own call because he should be doing his homework right now. But anyway, my youngest son has always had um, some struggle with um, just a lot of mental health issues throughout the years there. And so he has had so many falls there, but he's had some really good, um, uh, good, good accomplishments as well. And I think the reason why, again, is just because of that connection, especially I'm thinking kudos to Lausanne right now. Jason, without the support of the teachers at Lausanne, talking to them, you know, them reaching out to him when he's in trouble. If he hadn't had that, I don't think he would have been able to move forward. And then also just basically my husband and I trying to instill good coping skills with him and also trying to make sure that we were coping as well. You know, when your children are going through tough times, it's easy for you as parents to get really stressed out, but you need to make sure that you've got to be taking care of yourself. And if you don't, you are not going to be there for your kids. So when Jason was going through some of his most difficult times, I took that as an opportunity for me to be the best that I could be by making sure that I was getting my rest, making sure I was exercising, making sure that I was connected spiritually. I took care of myself. My husband took care of himself there. And because we were able to use good coping skills, Jason saw it and he was able to cope and get through a lot of the stuff that he was able to do. So again, he showed resilience there, but it was basically by a lot of coping and a lot of connections, he was able to do that there too. So, you know, again, there are a lot of examples and I can go on and on, but really, I'd like to hear from you guys. Have you guys ever um, seen any resilience in your children? Anybody? Hello, can you hear me okay? I can. Hey there, how are you? Hi, this is Artangela. This was an awesome presentation, Dr. Reed. Um, I really appreciate your transparency on this particular platform. And this was just awesome. So what I really want to say is about resilience. I would have to say, and I'm probably speaking for a lot of parents here, but I think just through COVID this last year, a lot of our children have been extremely resilient. They have pivoted through so many different challenges that honestly, some of us adults have probably had some issues with. And so with that being said, I think I wanna point out um, both, uh, I have two children, they, they both see you, um, but I wanna point out just school, just school within itself and the entire pivot through COVID and how not being around friends, not having you know, that sense of socialization with their classmates was really tough. It was really hard. And I too have to thank Lausanne for taking a stand and saying, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make the option to come back to campus mm -hmm. if the parents choose to, or we can do this thing virtually if, that, if that's best for your family. Of course, we chose to go back on campus and I could just see a complete difference in our children just because they need to be able to socialize with their peers. Um, also with you know, being out of school for the most part last spring after spring break, we could see a difference in just really trying to learn and, and have time management and so, I talked to our children about time management and I said, you know, I'm not going to lecture, lecture you about this, but I rather want to just instill in you some tips to make it a little bit easier. And we'll just use a stepwise approach 
and getting better with time, you know, because a lot of the kids sleep was off during this time, you know, just, it was just tough. And so what I did was I purchased planners. I am a huge <laughs> planner user. I have tons of planners around the house. So they always see me use it, but it was never anything they really thought about. And so I was the example and I never really pushed it. I just showed them how you could use this as a resource to write down your test, write down when you have homework and which subjects. That way you can break a lot of this material up and you're not so overwhelmed. And it worked. They did it without me pushing, so to speak. They did it without me, you know, talking to them and trying to remind them and really be that mother bird that's over them just watching. I really allowed them to take sole responsibility for that particular task. And I wanted them to own it. I wanted them to say, this is something I want to do so I can do better in my grades. Just as you said, not be perfect in anything, but just do your best exactly. and then work on those things. And so I've seen it. I have seen it firsthand. Um, so these seven C's, they work. <laughs> so I'm definitely, you know, I think we see it daily, but we don't think about it in that sense. And so I'm going to order this book too, just to kind of hone in on some of those. Um, like you, I can, I have so many different stories that I can share. I definitely want to share the platform with the rest of the parents, but I think that's a sure way that we can empower our, our children to really allow them chances to quote unquote mess up or make some mistakes and let them know that it's okay because those are teachable moments Absolutely. and they will learn from them and we will have their back. We will make sure that we support them and we can come and talk about it and see how we can do things better next time. Um, so yes, that's, that's what I wanted to share. That's fabulous. And it really is so true. And I love your children. And I know, you know, that, you know, what a great parent you are and just really instilling that into them is going to go a long way. And as I said, again, this, this past year has just been so awful there, but, you know, again, you know, break it, having your children, you know, get back into school, breaking things down in small, you know, uh, 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 tasks that they can do really helps, you know, and also just providing structure to, you know, letting them know that, uh, that, that really, even though the world is kind of messy right now, we can still have structure within our own home and we can still move forward there. And, 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 and really that quality time, you know, during this crazy time, making sure that you are there providing, you know, some, some fun time, some escape, because again, you know, they can't see their friends all the time. They can't do things that they want to do, but again, have that special bonding time. Again, knowing that you're there for them, but that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have a comment. Yes. Hey there. How are you? I'm fine. My name's Elizabeth. Thank you so much for speaking about the seven C's and uh, reminding me to uh, put some intentionality into those seven approaches to um, encouraging resilience. I, I see resilience in my children every day and they amaze me. Um, one is 10 and the other is, I think she's 26 by now. Oh, wow. Was, uh, <laughs> You're like me, you have an adult, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so particularly the way you describe the, the type of conversations where you can, uh, where the parent has somewhat of an agenda, but you open it in a casual discussion. So you, I mean, I don't mean agenda in a negative way, but you, you've right. got to kind of something you want to get to, but you open it up. We do a lot of that. And I, that it, it just speaking through the other seven ideas uh, in the modeling that you're doing as a parent with your children, it's inspiring, it's really helpful. And uh, I'm gonna be doing more of it. Sure. So I wanted to ask you though, as a parent, I can see that with the seven C's and your modeling um, behaviors and, and the other um, people who've been speaking like about having planners and these are great ways of modeling behaviors. Um, Okay, so I see this, and then I wonder from a pediatrician point of view, what do you see as the major 
coping issues where maybe more resilience besides COVID, we know the whole world turned upside down in the past year, but uh, pre-COVID, I, I look at social media, gaming, maybe being addicted to screens, uh, little things like um, anxiety that children have. And I wondered from your perspective as a pediatrician, what do you think the biggest issues behind uh, those type of anxieties and things where they need more resilience and need more coping uh, mechanisms. What do you think the biggest things are behind them? What is your feeling about kids who um, might need medication for their anxiety so that they can be more resilient or go with the flow more? I'm not sure. I don't know a lot about that subject, but and then on top of it, maybe there's too many questions, but is there a, is there a lot of follow-up for those kids who, who, who maybe need something to help them with their anxieties and issues beyond what we would be doing as modeling parents, as coaches almost? Good questions, really good questions. I hope I can try to tackle the best you can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more to be a patrician, not a, a, a therapist, but I think because children, you know, who have underlying anxiety, um, mm -hmm. they've actually suffered so much more during mm -hmm. this past year with the pandemic there. Mm -hmm. And, and that what we try to do when we see them actually in the offices, mm -hmm. We just kind of look at them and we, 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 we hope that they are able to open up to us mm -hmm. there. Oftentimes they're not there. Mm -hmm. But so we sometimes will go through kind of roundabout questions and saying, well, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? Are you engaged in the activities to pick up and see really if they are anxious? And if they are, then we say, okay, that's a red flag. This child needs help. This child needs more help than just the parent using the seven C's. But this child really may need some professional help there. You know, we as pediatricians, we're trained a little bit in helping with mm -hmm. anxiety, but not a lot. So when I see a child who really has true anxiety, I reach out to my my friends who are in the the, the, the field, the behavioral specialists there, and, and I give resources to my parents to really reach out to those therapists because those kids need their hands to be held a lot more closely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, what the therapist would do is really is just again to allow those children, those teens, to to be able to thought process kind of what you would do as a parent, but they yeah. would do it in a much more structured environment yeah. with really close follow-up. Most right. of the time, it's almost like sometimes twice a week, or at least once a week, to yeah. make sure that those kids are getting those good skills on board. Medication, yeah, you know, we don't always use medication as the first resource um, for kids who are having anxiety, but there are cases when it needs to be done. Uh -huh. And so if the anxiety is so severe that the therapist may feel like he or she just needs the child to take, you know, uh, take the edge off of whatever is going on, they may suggest to me to try mm -hmm. to offer something. But again, that's not the first thing that we always do. We like to get the kids to try to help get those skills on board first. And then if it looks like there's still an issue, then yeah, we can back up with medication there. Thank does you. That, does that help a little bit there? Perfect, thank you. Good deal. <laughs> Anybody else who'd like to share about your kids, about you know, things that you're going through with your kids um, as far as resilience, um, any, you know, any issues as far as, um, you know, trying to understand the seven C's a little bit better. You know, as I said, you don't have to have all the seven C's in order to get the resilience. It may be just one or two or three there. And oftentimes they're really interconnected there. But again, just kind of having those, that, you know, those building blocks on hand really will kind of, you know, build the framework to get that resilience. My name is Tasha Livingston and um, my daughter is actually her in her first year at, at Lausanne and awesome. we were at Briarcrest for six years prior to that. And, and um, I will say I'm actually a parent that has chosen to keep my daughter at home because I work from home. And, and so she's now been home for a year basically. 
And um, I do check in. I, I wonder if um, I'm asking all the right questions or she seems, I'm so proud of her. I mean, I think she seems very resilient um, for what we've all been through. Um, now she does have to go back and forth. She does get, she hasn't been here for a year, but she does go to her dad's house, you know? And so, you know, I don't know if that's maybe some relief too for her um, since she isn't going into the school um, every day. Um, but I do see definitely some resilience there. And I do check in with her to see, you know, how are you feeling? I know we've been at home for a while and um, she doesn't even really go to the stores and stuff with me. So I just, I'm gonna, um, even though I feel confident that I have checked in with her, I, the, the seven C's I think are gonna allow me to um, do a little bit better job as well. I think um, I'll take any advice from some of the other parents and yourself on here. I think the one thing that I've done, she's my only child and um, anybody that has an only child, I, I do feel like I, um, you know, am on top all the time and hovering and um, I, I've tried this year and I've learned that from the Lausanne way um, to kind of back off a little bit and, and let her have, you know, the relationships. And I think Mr. Brazina has been very helpful with that being her advisor as well. And um, he kind of keeps me in line, I think, too. <laughs> and so um, I see that um, her confidence is coming out. Um, for example, they just did a mock trial today. And, and I really felt like she was going to be kind of intimidated and what have you. And I probably still look like she's maybe seven or something. She's 12 now. But you know, I really felt like she was going to be intimidated. Um, but when she was done, I was just so proud of, you know, the conversation that we had. It, it was very impressive. I mean, just I don't know if 11 to 12 is or fifth grade to sixth grade is some some huge thing that happens or what have you, but I feel like there's been some kind of shift um, in her. And um, I mean, I can't wait for her to go next year and actually be in the school. Um, but I really feel like uh, Lausanne has done a great job for the online learners as well, where I don't feel like she's really missed a beat. And I really feel like her confidence has really improved from fifth grade to sixth grade. And I think a lot of that has to do with how Lausanne teaches and even how they teach the parents. So right. That's great. Yeah. Well, I definitely second that. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. But yeah. thank you. I thought that this was this was fantastic and I'm going to get the book as well. So thank you. That's great. Well, good deal. Well, good. Great. Well, I don't know if anyone else has anything. As I said, I'm here for you. And, um, you know, um, I've been in practice as a pediatrician for almost 30 years. And as I said, we've seen a lot of behavioral, you know, um, problems come, uh, you know, across our office there. But, you know, the good thing about it is that really parents do want the best for their children. And even though, whether they call it the seven C's or whatever, I think, it's just in our, it's in our, it's in our DNA as parents is that we do really watch our children. We observe them. We know when something's not right there and we really try our best to try to help them solve it there. Yeah. Sometimes we do tend to lecture more. Or sometimes we tend to kind of hover more, but for the most part, I think we, we, we try, we do try to allow our children to figure it out. And I think if you just continue to do that, really, those kids are just going to be amazing and do what they need to do. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Does anyone have any other questions or comments or Amy? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi, guys. Um, Amy Rowling. I actually teach at Lausanne and I have three um, anxiety filled children of my own. Um, so I completely see it. My oldest is going to be 21 this year and um, I he's my first, he's my baby for a very long time. So I had a really hard time kind of letting him do things. Um, but he's super resilient now and impresses me every day with what he can do. Um, I mean, he can build a computer watching a YouTube video. So he's, <laughs> he's going places. That's um, uh, so my middle child, I don't have to worry about him at all. His, his, everything hits him and it rolls off like a water on a duck's back. Um, my daughter had some troubles, especially at the beginning of this pandemic. She's eight. 
um, and she's super social, can't socially distance from anything. That's why she's learning from home right now still. Um, but she, she had a really hard time for several months, um, but she has become resilient. Um, right. And I think it helped me being home with her through last spring um, and kind of helping her with the seven C's. Right. Um, but she's, right. she's come out of it. And, and I think our kids are going to be better for it. Um, but my comment really is not really a question, but as, as a teacher, you know, especially at Lausanne, um, those seven C's we try to instill in our students as well. So we know that, you know, especially as a math teacher, you know, I, I could give all the kids all the answers and they would pass the test, no problem, but they have to have that productive struggle in order to understand what's going on. So um, I kind of, I try my best to instill resilience in my students as well. So That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, this was amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it there. That's great. And it looks like Patrice Thomas has her hand up. Hi, Patrice. <laughs> Another Patrice, that's weird. That's not a very common name. So Rudolph, that's interesting there. Great. Do I need to? Patrice, did you have a question? It's okay if you're just stuck. I actually hit the little emoji things literally all the time on X. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Patrice, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. All right. You're connecting though, so I have hope. <laughs> yeah. All right, Patrice, are you there? All right, we'll come back in just a second, Patrice. I'm gonna try to do some tech on my end. Does anybody else have a question? So I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You can go first. That's okay. I'm sorry. My picture's now. My name is Kina Alert, and I have two daughters. Um, yeah. Thinking about the seven C's, I feel like my oldest has always been very competent and confident with school. Um, the one I'm still thinking about, I feel like in response to the pandemic, that control factor has has risen quite a bit. Like she wants to be in control a whole lot of things, not just her day, but her connections and all of that. And I'm wondering if you have advice on kind of um, helping to alleviate some of that, like the need to control is how she's getting through things, if that makes sense. Um, hopefully that's translating. <laughs> So do you think that she's controlling too much? Is that what she, it almost yes. is, Yeah. And, and that's actually a very good point. You know, yeah, we want our children to be in control, but there's a fine line. We don't want our children to feel like they have to control everything because there's some things that we just need to let it go. I wonder though, if her way of controlling is maybe uh, a sense of her just feeling um, a little bit over, you know, wanting to do something to kind of offset the feeling of just being out of control with the, the pandemic itself. And so what you may want to do is actually, you know, um, you know, sit down and talk to her and ask her really outright, you know, really, how are you feeling there? Um, is there anything that's really, that you're really worried about, that you're, you're concerned about? She may or may not answer that question there, but if she does not, give her an outlet there. You know, first of all, let her know that, you know, we're gonna get through this, life is gonna be okay, but maybe try some relaxation techniques and get her to, you know, find ways to just kind of release and rather than control. And, you know, maybe encourage her to, you know, um, um, you know, pick up a hobby or maybe, you know, doing some relaxation techniques so that she's not always focused on what she can control, but just kind of just stepping back and just kind of relaxing and, and, and just being in the moment rather than feeling that she has to always control. Does that help a little bit? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. This is Patrice Thomas. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi, <laughs> well, great. I, I, great. Well, I'll, I'll apologize for that. I was actually on my uh, route home and it was uh, 
I was logged in via my phone and was trying to log in also via uh, Zoom once I pulled into the driveway. So um, so please excuse me because I'm going to leave the video off uh, as a result of me being in my car. Uh, but I actually just wanted to share, of course, I have three children that are at Los in Jackson, Madison, and Miles, which actually are patients of yours. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, I know. I, I wasn't allowed to say that, but I was waiting for you <laughs> to say that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and, and so of course, uh, between of course Lausanne as well as having Dr. Reeves, of course, is our pediatrician. I think um, you know our children um, have shown resilience. Um, as a matter of fact, of course, you know my husband, his brother was one of the first ones out of the gate back in April who passed away when there wasn't a lot known about COVID. And of course, my children, um, you know, saw that firsthand. Him actually, you know, suffering uh, with COVID for about 40 days. Uh, in the hospital with him not understanding why no one could come see him and so forth. And so, of course, um, starting out, our family did choose to um, stay remote in terms of learning uh, very early on. But to see, uh, first of all, I do want to praise Lausanne for, you know, providing that option. And two, um, particularly for my smallest one, um, who I was most concerned about uh, in first grade, how uh, uh, Ms. Whitaker did such an excellent job in making sure that he felt connected. Um, and uh, even though he was in front of the screen for you know uh, six hours out of the day, but she ensured that she included him. And so that was one of my, uh, uh, no where I noticed the resilience in even a first grader in how he was able to, um, for so many months, um, um, still not only, you know, really thrive academically, even in a remote environment. In terms of my older um, children, who I have um, an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old, who both um, were experiencing, really interesting to see them um, really be independent and to so many of the other um uh, parents that are on the call where uh, they had to uh, figure it out, but not only figure it out, but actually uh, hold themselves accountable for um, uh, uh, being logged on, for turning in assignments and so forth, and without, you know, much of our involvement. So um, just right. saw that real resilience uh, there coming out. And then finally, uh, you know, just kind of late in the process, my 13-year-old, um, ultimately, you know, finally expressed some uh, some real anxiety around staying um, in. But then, quickly, I'll, I'll say, uh, when he started expressing the anxiety, he quickly said, "Well, hey, I can't have a a, a nervous breakdown now. I got too much work I need to do um, to make." Uh, <laughs> and then he he pulled himself together and ultimately uh, was fine after he talked through why why he was feeling that way. Um, and so we did at that time um, you know, provide kind of an outlet where he could do some social distancing. Um, and then, of course, after we both got vaccinated, uh, they have, in fact, returned to school now. But did want to share that experience. That's great. Thank you. That's great there. Charlotte, did you have a question? I'm sorry. I feel like I jumped on top of you earlier too. Sorry. <laughs> well, you're fine. Um, well, I feel like I have questions, but I don't know if there are answers to my questions because I have, a, I'm on the, uh, I guess I'm like one of the few people here where I'm dealing with a very small child who's, as I like to call her, a three-nager. <laughs> as you've seen her lately, Dr. Reed, you can concur probably with that statement. Um, she's very sassy. Um, but she also, I mean, she's young. She struggles to understand what she's feeling when she's feeling it. We're going to be dealing with some death in the family soon. So this will be her first experience with that. She's an only child. We're trying not to be those parents, you know, that's all I ever think about is don't be that parent. She's an only child. You don't, you don't want her to have only child syndrome. So as you say, like giving her confidence, but also letting her try things on her own, you know, but it's still early. So yes, lots of questions. Don't know if there are answers. 
there are answers and we may actually have you come into the office and maybe we can chit chat about some of them, especially, you know, as you mentioned, I'm so sorry to hear about the death, um, mm -hmm. possible death there too, but there are definitely ways that you can help her to cope, no doubt about it there. Um, and again, it is very different, you know, because she's a little bit younger, but there are still definitely some very good coping skills that you can instill in her early on. Yeah, yeah. great. Hard place to talk. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed the, my husband took her the last time. Otherwise, I would have talked about it then. <laughs> no, 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 but she really is a teenager. She's, she's very sharp for a three-year-old there. She's yeah, like, so I like to, it's like with COVID, I just push it off to the side thinking she's not going to remember it. But she's pretty sharp and she's pretty oh, smart. Sure. And I feel like, you know, I just want to make sure that I'm helping her get through this. And, you know, she's not going to look back on it later. So, yeah. yeah. We, we, we definitely can make that work. Great. That's awesome. So I actually, I had a whole list of questions because I was like, you know, everybody's tired at the end of the day, but this was such a great discussion um, about resilience and about our students and our kids. Um, I put some stuff in the chat, but I have a almost 13 year old. So I have an actual almost teenager um, who is two inches taller than me. Um, she's, <laughs> she's a lot. So, um, but, you know, I think that one of the things that really stood out to me in this was letting our kids, like letting them have some control, letting them fail. Um, I think that the natural inclination a lot of times, especially for me is to be like, oh, like I'll help you. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want you to get hurt. And I think that that is probably, I mean, she knows I've got her back a hundred percent, but I think that, you know, not, not letting her fail a little bit maybe is, is something that I need to work on too, um, as a parent. So I really, yeah. that really spoke to me. Yeah. And we all do. And I've actually, I've, I've realized that actually more now that my children are older and that they're actually you know on their own to some degree but they're still there there are times when I really want to say hey I can do this for you but it's hard it's sometimes not saying anything is the absolutely most difficult thing you can do but but they've got to learn they really do and they will learn and each and every time that they do that's just one layer of confidence that they are building there. So as difficult as it may be, we really have to do our best just to sit back and let them figure it out there. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I also was a pre-law student um, <laughs> who got to my senior year of college and said, oh my gosh, I can't do this. So that story really resonated with me too. Um, spoiler alert, I didn't go to law school. I obviously chose a different path and went to grad school for history instead, but um, yeah. it's hard to let kids make their own decisions. So I really, I appreciate all that you said. I have a lot to think about too. So thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Right. Does anyone else have any other questions, any comments? I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, all right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, Dr. Reed, thank you so much for being here and taking the time thank out of your day. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys. And thank you guys for sharing. Really, I love to hear your comments and, 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 and what's going on with your kids there. Uh, I think I know a few of you guys and really just as it, it means so much to me. So thank you for again, allowing me to share a few moments with you. And I just hope it all works out well for everybody there. So thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful night. I will send you the recording tomorrow. And um, don't forget if you're, if you like this kind of very low key format, very fun and casual, we have our book club, um, which is also about social emotional learning at the end of this month on the 31st. And we're reading, um, speaking of imperfection and perfectionism, we're reading um, Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfection. So Right. Um, if you, like me, struggle with perfectionism and what I like to call former gifted child syndrome, um, I would love to see you on the 31st. It's on our website and I'll send you everyone a link too. So have a wonderful night and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye. Bye.